Well, good morning, everybody. We will officially start our colloquium today. The speaker is Professor Michał Oszmaniec from our institute. Welcome, everybody. Uh, yeah, great to be able to present my, my work here. Uh, just uh, a little disclaimer. Two days ago, I came back from a long trip to Japan and I still suffer from jet lag. So uh, mm -hmm. apologize for this. Uh, but I'm very enthusiastic about the topic. So uh, hopefully, I'll make it for that. Right, so I'll be talking about how to simulate gener uh, generalized quantum measurements uh, via projective measurements in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Uh, and it's uh, joint work with uh, Michał, uh, Michał Kotowski from the uh, Faculty of Mathematics uh, of the University of Warsaw. Uh, right, so it's a, supposed to be a colloquium, so I will start from from, from the basics, so so how uh, like how we measure things in, in quantum theory. So yeah, so this is the the basic picture I, I have in mind. So uh, a state of a quantum system is uh, described by a, a, a dense matrix. Uh, it's a positive definite. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't know how this is. Yeah. So, somebody likes quantum space. Uh, yeah, so positive definite uh, matrix on, on a secret space of interest. So, I, I have my quantum system, I want to measure it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we <laughs> like uh, only by a measurement we can access quantum objects. And, uh, uh, we have inherent randomness to, to, to quantum theory. Uh, so when we measure, we don't always get the same answer, but we get different uh, answers with different probabilities. And the rule how to get those probabilities is called Born rule. So upon uh, having a dense matrix row in the input, uh, when I measure using some measurement apparatus M, I get outcome probability k with, uh, with probability, which is given by the trace of the product of this dense matrix row and uh, uh, this operator mk. This is a measurement operator, or uh, in order, it's also called an effect. So uh, to make sure it's a valid probability distribution, uh, those effects, those operators. I mean, they're, they're just matrices. So you can think of them as matrices. Uh, they they have to be positive definite. Uh, so they have positive definite eigenvalues. They are Hermitian. And they have to form a resolution of identity uh, on a given Hilbert space. And uh, maybe you're all familiar with some restricted class of those measurements, namely uh, projective measurements. So those are uh, measurements that, well, uh, their effects or their measurement operators, they are just orthogonal projectors on the on the Hilbert space of, of interest. So they, when you square those effects, they are uh, PI squared is PI, and they are mutually orthogonal. Um, and the reason why you are familiar with them is that in, a, in the textbook quantum mechanics uh, course, they are sort of associated to measuring of observables uh, that are described by Hermitian operators on, a, again, on a Hilbert space of interest. So when you measure energy, uh, you, uh, from shot to shot, will be getting, uh, you know, you'll be measuring a projective measurement, which is associated to, say, eigen, uh, eigen, decomp uh, eigen decomposition and uh, of the uh, associated to this uh, uh, eigen, space. eigen space decomposition associated to, to this observable. <laughs> okay. And uh, right. Uh, it's supposed to be a colloquium, so I, I put really like some really cartoonish pictures of how those measurements are being done in various platforms for right, uh, that realize the paradigm of quantum computing. So in trapped ions uh, measurement process, 
is based on fluorescence. Uh, so you have some excited states in, in individual uh, ions that uh, if, if, if they are excited, they emit light and you can record it. Uh, in case of super superconducting qubits, you have a coupling of your, I think it's like Josephson junction where this qubit sort of leaves to some uh, resonator. Uh, and depending what state of a qubit you have here, uh, like a resonator frequency of uh, uh, of this thing changes. And when you shot some microwave pulses on it, it behaves different differently. So uh, uh, this is how you can tell whether you have qubits in a ground or an excited state. And uh, right, finally, in photonics, you can think of just detectors of photons in some interferometric network. Uh, right. And uh, like basically all those measurements are, at least in ideal scenario, projective. But still we have those more general objects, generalized measurements. And uh, like my talk is about like trying to compare the two. Okay. Uh, and could you give an example of generalized uh, measurement? Of course, I, I will be giving plenty of examples later. Very good. Later, I mean, a few examples later on. Uh, right. So, uh, but you can, okay, maybe the, the basic, just the basic example can be, you know, on a qubit. Uh, you know, you have a block sphere, uh, and you are gonna have a, uh, right. Now you have a qubit, uh, and you have those uh, three states that point in the uh, they are aligned like this on a block sphere, uh, and uh, basically when you set uh yeah uh yeah when you when you set those effects to be equal be proportional to those projectors with this specific weight uh you know when you add those guys up you're gonna get the, the like identity and they are not mutually orthogonal so this is the basic mm -hmm. basic example in a qubit uh yeah so how you know we have those more general uh, quantum of uh, more general measurements p of m so how how to realize them uh experimentally so so this is again like a cartoonish version of how you can realize them so the the trick is that you you can always uh for any generalized measurement uh on say d-dimensional Hubert space uh you can always uh Mimic or simulate it by a projective measurement that uh, that acts in a larger space, that's extended Hilbert space, uh, whose dimension is uh, equal to the number of, of effects of, of outcomes of original measurement. Uh, so, so previously what, it was D D. I don't see D. Here is D. Uh -huh. And then the... here is us. Right. Uh, here is N. Yeah. Okay, so I have an outcomes. Now I'm using, like, I claim you can simulate every such measurement with a projective measurement mm -hmm. on uh, the tax on CM. So I apologize for that. So what you should be, uh, what you should think of is, in order to simulate this measurement procedure. Uh, so so here this procedure is about measuring a state row used with, using measurement operators M. And getting some outcome k, uh, you should think that you put some additional degrees of freedom, say some extra qubits. You entangle this whole, like this system of interest, together with extra uh, qubits. Uh, do some collective measurements uh, that is projective, and again get outcome k. So this is cartoon, okay. So, uh, but uh, you know, for non-quantum people, just think that you can just mimic the, those general measurements as just projective ones on a an large space when you put uh, when you put just some fixed state here, 
uh, on additional degrees of freedom. So this is as far as Carlton is concerned, more mathematically. Uh, yeah, the theorem that settles this, this simulation procedure is called Nightwork Extension Theorem. And it's clean sort of formulated for the class of measurements uh, where those measurement operators, they are rank one matrices. So just like in that example, they are proportional to, to states, okay, to projectors onto states in a Hilbert space. And then, so the claim is uh, that for, uh, for every such generalized measurement, uh, uh, you can find projectors on this extended space that has dimension that is uh, equal to the, the number of effects, such that for every state row on this uh, smaller space, uh, like trace of uh, like overlap of this row with the effect, uh, and, and k equals to the trace of row with bigger projector pk. So that has to hold to all states. So mathematically, this just means uh, that those effects mk, they are just projected versions of uh, measurement operators pk on this uh, that act on the on the larger space. So you can think of uh, that this Nyman ex uh, extension uh, uh, measurements they are of the following form they are like block rectangular matrix and in the upper left corner that corresponds to the Hubert space of interest I have measurement MK and in other corners I have some junk mm -hmm. some uh, any numbers so I mean I only need this to be I, I can fix them in the right way uh, but when I'm contracting this measurement with the state that lives on in this corner, I'm just gonna see this part. Great. Can you so, what is the difference between the extended Hilbert space and the ordinary Hilbert space? Well, I, I, I mean, there is no formal. I'm actually viewing uh, the Hilbert space. So, for example, case of all. We cannot hear you. Something happened to this. Something with my heart. Voice. I can, I will try to repeat. So just for, okay, uh, mathematically, let's say um, I can think that this physical Hilbert space H is just a subspace of this extended Hilbert space. Okay. Is, is the extended Hilbert space also a Hilbert space? Yes, yes. It's a, so, so why yes. the term extended if it is a Hilbert space? What well, is how is it the extension yeah. defined? Right. So I can think of maybe two uh, two examples. One example would be if I want to measure, you know, in some physical scenarios. No, I would like can... to hear the definition of the extended Hilbert space. I know what is Hilbert space. Hey, some additional Hilbert space. Uh, extended Hilbert space. Well, uh, uh, in some, uh, you can view this as auxiliary mathematical object, I can try to give you uh, like a, some physical scenarios where it makes sense to uh, and how it arises naturally. Okay, uh, which do you prefer? Uh, can, I, can, I, can I please sort of like end it? Uh, extended here means that it's the original Hilbert space tensorly multiplied by a finite dimensional Hilbert space which acts as an auxiliary Hilbert space. It has it nothing is, to do with uh, rich Krislev definitions. It has it nothing to do with the Hilbert rich space. Hilbert space. So extended Hilbert space here is another Hilbert space. I can do finite dimensional, but it is extended by tensorly multiplying the initial Hilbert space Love with that. additional Hilbert space, which carries additional degrees of freedom, which are later traced over. That's the essence of the Nightmare Dilution Theorem. It can be checked in, I guess, quite a lot of uh, mathematical textbooks on, on quantum mechanics. It's a tensor product of two Hilbert spaces, in this case, finite dimensional. There is absolutely nothing uh, strange about it. Yeah, but the question is how to choose this. 
additional no, space. But is it a matter of this theorem? Well, the so, theorem so, so, basic, okay, so I can sketch just quickly two physical scenarios from the, the, the Sarizes. Think that I have a distinguished system of, uh, say, some number of qubits in a, in a prototype of a quantum computer of interest. And then I have uh, their Hilbert space is one Hilbert space, and I perhaps want to measure them in a general way. So I'm gonna attach other degrees of freedom, say other qubits, uh, and do some collective measurements on the combined system to to measure my initial system. This is let's say one scenario. Igor, isn't it so that if you have let's say five original defects, MK, okay, yeah. you have M1, M2, M3, yeah. M4, M5. Then the space, the minimal dimension of the space that you attach is C5. Uh, but, that is uh, that is true, but I'm gonna contest in this construction. Yes. Yeah, but just the basic example so that people have uh, set. Yes. Have yes. Watch the yes. The so in 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 this example that concerns a qubit, I need to have in total three dimensional uh, space. So I need to attach at least another qubit. If you follow, if one follows your construction. Okay, so we have some physics, some prescription how to measure, so how to implement those generalized measurements from projective measurements that act on uh, uh, some like uh, on extended physical systems. Uh, so uh, still, okay. Now before I just move on, I want to just mention that uh, that those generalized measurements they found many applications throughout quantum information quantum computing i just go like goes uh, relatively fast through the list so for example uh readout noise so in, in prototypes of quantum computers uh, uh readout is somehow important factor the uh, readout errors they affect uh, in some architectures it's uh, very present and uh, as a let's say you can you you, you cannot model, model your measurements as ideal projective measurements you have to take into account noise and you can have some restructure of measurement errors that can occur and uh, in, in large scale devices and in my group i just i'm just sketching it we are also interested in this topic and so it will be a nice work uh, where the leading author is uh, Janek Tuziemski at so this one on the archive where we sort of play with larger devices uh, and study correlations in, in readout. Just advertisement. It should be out before the end of the project, TeamNet, so in less than two months. Uh, and another, okay, this is more for quantum information people. Uh, right, some basic task in quantum information is quantum state discrimination. So you have some Say so you can think that you have a game that one party prefers some states rho i with some prior uh, probabilities pi in every round, and the task of a measurement device is to tell which state was generated in a given round of the experiment. And uh, so um, you can, for example, phrase some cryptographic attacks on uh, some attacks on. Uh, Cryptographic uh, on quantum cryptography in this way, for example. Um, right, so you can use in general, uh, you should use uh, those POVMs, not projective measurements, to do it. Uh, ah, that's the same example that I sketched on the board. So for this, uh, this particular measurement with this normalization, one can actually show that this is an optimal measurements for discriminating among uh, like uh, for uh, states generated in this ensemble that's that's a sort of aligned with those three effects okay and uh, uh, over there and you have some advantage between uh, uh, like optimal strategy and the best strategy you can hope for using projective measurements another example uh, concerns uh, metro, uh, especially multi-parameter metrology and tomography of quantum objects, states in particular. So the general scenario you can think of is that you have 
some quantum process uh, that imprints some unknown parameters uh, that are gathered in tuple theta in, onto, uh, onto my state. And my task is to estimate to learn those parameters in optimal way, uh, let it be a phase uh, or some parameters of a quantum state. In general, I should be using uh, generalized measurement to construct my estimators. I'm just, I think there are some generalized versions of teleportation uh, that for POVMs also show up. And other scenarios that like uh, randomness generation from non locality. Uh, the details are not important. I'm just giving you some selected list of topics or uh, in some quantum algorithms, especially for non abelian version of hidden subgroup problem, POVMs sort of appear. Okay. So, that being said, what is the topic of my lecture today? Uh, the topic is okay, how much more powerful or useful those generalized measurements, POVMs, are compared to projective measurements uh, in a setting when dimension of my Hilbert spaces go to infinity. Okay, so I gave you some example, <laughs> like simple qubit example where uh, generalized measurement offered some advantage over project uh, over projected measurements, but I'm sort of here fundamentally interested asymptotically how how the advantage behaves as dimension of my system changes that goes to infinity. But, you know with your answer I will only be getting yeah the answer would be not so much oh, actually yeah. in the end. But it's, it took me yeah, yeah. six Maybe years to figure or seven to figure this out, but uh, <laughs> right. Uh, I'm motivated, you know, for applications coming from quantum computing when when, when we have many qubits. Uh, so naturally, we have large, large and larger Hilbert spaces. Okay, so uh, that's the question. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm just maybe sketching what is the question and what are the. I will. Give you maybe the answer, some implications. I will probably not have time to discuss. I mean, maybe at the end some sketches of the proof. But I, I think it's maybe more important to, uh, uh, like, for you to understand like the motivation and what is the general idea, rather than to like specifics of the proof. So feel free just to interrupt with questions, comments. Uh, yeah. So to 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 put this question in the rigorous. The discussion about relative power between projective and generalized measurements. To put it on a rigorous footing, I, I, I need to introduce some uh, some auxiliary uh, uh, some extra things, namely uh, some ways in which we can manipulate quantum measurements, because uh, <laughs> it's, uh, classically it's going to be important. So, because you know when I when I perform in the lab measurement M. I can always, upon getting outcome, classical outcome, I can always put this outcome in a classical computer, in a classical device, and process it somehow, like label the outcome, maybe apply some probabilistic process that will be randomly shifting my outcomes. And this is, I, I consider this to be allowed, because uh, there is nothing quantum about this classical post processing. <laughs> uh, so, mathematically, Mathematically, when you uh, this this uh, this uh, class of transformations is defined by stochastic maps or stochastic transformations, okay, and they just transform uh, uh, transform uh, effects of original measurement into effects of this transformed uh, measurement according to some prescription. You just have some linear mapping there, uh, right? So this is uh, this I consider is allowed. Also, uh, I'm gonna assume that <laughs> randomization is allowed. So this is uh, uh, this is uh, the following procedure. So assume I, I can perform in a laboratory two measurements, M or N, uh, and 
I have power to, uh, in a given round of the experiment, randomly choose which measurement I'm going to perform. Let's say with probability Q, I'm going to implement on my state M, and with probability 1 minus Q, so uh, experimental settings. I don't, okay. Uh, you know, I implement one unit, I'm relatively fast, maybe changing of the set uh, of the. Your voice is missing. <clears throat> I think something happened to this connection. Clearly. Definitely something happened. Is this a post production? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes, we got some crackle. Hello. Now, maybe now you can hear me? Oh. Now? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hey, Carol. Great. Ah, good to see you, Carol. Yes. Uh, so, there are even more people here. Right. So, uh, right, so this procedure, this operational procedure, uh, mm -hmm. allows you to implement mathematically convex combination of, uh, of measurements, which I want to just apply uh, to, to, to getting convex combination of, uh, of effects. Okay, so I get a new measurement whose effects are convex combinations of effects of original measurement. Uh, great. So I'm allowing uh, this, uh, yeah, I'm just allow, uh, assuming it's possible that I can do it. And now uh, I can now uh, define precisely the class of measurements against which I'm going to compare power of generalized measurements, namely projective simulable measurements. So this is uh, the class of measurements that, as the name suggests, uh, entails uh, like uh, performing uh, projective measurements on my system of interest. So no one is allowed, but I can really post-process them classically and I can uh, get uh, complex combinations of them. Okay, so I am uh, I'm allowing projective measurements, but I can take their complex mixtures and the uh, task of post-processing. Uh, and this class of measurements we defined that was some, some work I did already at ICFA uh, in my postdoc. Uh, geometrically, you can think that, uh, you know, this whole big blob is the set of all measurements on d dimensional space. Uh, in some external points of this set are projective measurements, though the, this bold green. Uh, and, and Finally, projective simulable measurements, they are just convex combinations of projective measurements. So this is the object we are geometrically after. Uh, I can, ah, oh, okay. Okay, there is some example, right? Uh, some example, I can just, uh, on a qubit, I can just uh, randomly implement two bases. Uh, this is one basis, this is another basis, and I'm going to get those four effects in this way, and it's going to be projective simulable because I can interpret it that for some probability I implement this basis, probability one half for some probability this base. Good. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm now, I want to go to high dimensional setting. Uh, so, I'm gonna quantify this, this advantage via something that maybe at first it's gonna look uh, not so, I mean, relatively humble, uh, but then you see applications. Probably I just conclude with applications. I'm not gonna present uh, proofs. Uh, right, so, you know, when I have a, a quantum state, I can define the polarizing noise. Uh, so with probability T, I keep the state intact. With probability one minus T, I, uh, prepare maximal mixed state on the dimensional system. And now, okay, uh, uh, now I can, uh, I can uh, by duality act with this map on measurements. So uh, I can think that I'm adding noise to the state just before the measurements took place. And I can keep track how measurement effects get changed. They are changed in this way, so uh, they become noisy. 
So with priority P, I, uh, T, I have the good measurement with this other, uh, with priority one minus T, I have this, uh, this funny measurement whose measurements, uh, whose effects are proportional to identity. And uh, the game, okay, is relatively simple. So for this parameter T equal to one, I have my original measurement as I'm uh, decreasing the value of T, I'm going to hit the region of projective simulable measurements eventually, because for t equal to zero, I just have a trivial measurement that uh, that I can really easily simulate by projective measurement. And what I'm after for a given measurement is the, the, the greatest t for which I'm still projective simulable. Okay, so, uh, so this is the critical visibility for uh, for the for a given measurement, and in this paper from already six years ago, uh, with uh, uh, Leo Guarini, Peter Vitek, who passed away unfortunately, and and Tony Asin, for example, we are able to prove uh, in dimension D the following lower bound for this critical visibility. So we could say that if your noise is very large. Uh, uh, so this visibility is one over d or smaller. Uh, then you can simulate uh, via projective measurements ge uh, any generalized measurement. But my boss uh, uh, Tony was always like asking, says like, is this uh, asking is this inequality tight? <laughs> and now after uh, over six years, I can say it really wasn't tight because what we do prove, and this is main result. Of, of, of our work is that in any dimension, finite dimension D, there exists some absolute constant, and let's say I think two percent is a is some proxy to this constant. That when I add uh, such that this noise diversion of a measurement with visibility two percent uh, will be projectively smallable. Okay. So it may look now maybe technical for, uh, for you. I'm going to show some nice applications of, of, the, of this result. Uh, but morally, you can think that if you just add like a constant, in some sense, constant amount of noise with the polarizing noise, uh, you can get around without adding additional degrees of freedom and you can be as powerful. OK? Any, any, Carol, you wanted to ask, or no? Carol explains. She understands this very well. Uh, so consequences, consequences. And uh, I'm supposed to talk for 45 minutes, or? OK. Uh, consequences. So I just probably go with consequences. And uh, so first, for state discrimination, so uh, Broadcast of tasks in, tasks in quantum information can be casted as uh, state, uh, as minimal error state discrimination. So again, this is about distinguishing some states that are paired with some prior probability uh, uh, via uh, uh, via generalized measurement. And I can now, for a given ensemble of states epsilon, I can find the best strategy that involves projective measurements. Uh, and quantify success probability that I'm getting. And I can define the optimal strategy and the optimal success probability for when I use generalized measurement. And my claim is uh, I'm not going to get unbounded advantage uh, in uh, when the dimension of the system increases. So, uh, uh, right. Uh, so, so uh, basically, uh, optimal strategy based on projective measurements uh, is at least some co this absolute constant c times the optimal strategy uh, times optimal probability for the generalized measurements okay so i cannot have increasing advantage as dimension of my system uh, increases always projective measurements will be quite good okay so this is one application well, second applications maybe for uh, so apologize for non-experts. I just say something fast for I, for people that know this, and we go to more interesting stuff. So there is this important paradigm of 
shadow tomography uh, that was introduced in Aronson six or seven years ago uh, and really got traction with the nature paper by Huang Kang and Preskill from three years ago. The task of this primitive is to uh, estimate many non commuting uh, expectation values of a huge number of non commuting observables. And typically, people use projective measurements or randomized projective measurements for this task. And, but you can uh, think that maybe using generalized measurements offers an advantage. Uh, okay, the details really don't matter. The, at the end, uh, there is no advantage as far as at least uh, by variances of estimators are concerned. So uh, for experts, there is not like in the single shot shadow tomography, there is no unbounded advantage of generalized measurements over projective measurements. Uh, just this, and maybe this is the the nicest now applica uh, nicest application for it's for more people for foundations of quantum mechanics, and it has to do with non locality. Now, so uh, this is the main of of, of Remic works and Remic group. Uh, so uh, you know uh, I can. Uh, when I have a bipartite state shared between Alice and Bob, uh, you know, I put it in a usual Bayer scenario. So one party uh, is going to implement some measurements MA, another party measurements MB that are chosen, each of those sets are chosen in some way. Uh, right. And the question is can, can I simulate output statistics? <laughs> From this experiment by a hidden variable model, where instead of this bipartite quantum state, I have some hidden uh, some uh, hidden variable that is sent uh, to to the parties, uh, and then they perform some classical processing based on this classical value lambda that they got. So I mean, around Bell inequality. Uh, and Bell non locality, there was Nobel Prize, right? Uh, just last year. So it's a topic we had beautiful, I forgot who gave an account of that, but we, we had some accounts of, of the Nobel Prize from last year. I think uh, for experimental demonstration. Right. So now, if, if I can, if for a given uh, bipartite state uh, and for all local generalized measurements, I can hook up this local hidden variable model, uh, then I say that my state is P of VM local. But I can also, in the same <laughs> scenario, consider the case where locally parties only do projective measurements. Because, you know, experimentally, it's easier to perform projective measurements. Also, mathematically, it's easier to, to prove that some state is uh, local in that sense. And uh, there were two families of states that were intensely studied over the years. Uh, that were instant, uh, intensely studied over the years. Uh, mm, from the, from this perspective, namely Werner state. This is a convex mixture between uh, antisymmetric. Okay, I have now two qubits, so two d-dimensional systems. Okay, so our dimension of Alice and Bob is the same. And I can have a projection onto antisymmetric subspace of those two factors, onto antisymmetric tensors. And I can have identity. Uh, and uh, that is a very boring state, nothing happens. So convex mixture between uh, normalized projection onto antisymmetric subspace and uh, identity is called Werner state. This is, by the way, famous Werner state from the paper from 1989, where Werner was the first one that I think defined what entanglement is. And uh, he already there pointed out that the fact that entanglement is not the same as non locality, namely that you can have states that have local models, even though they are entangled. And the like, various states were examples of that. And uh, you have also isotropic states. 
uh, that are just interpolation between uh, maximally entangled state onto uh, onto qubits and maximally mixed. Now, uh, technical details are not so in, uh, important, <laughs> but I should maybe say that there was a lot of industry of developing uh, local hidden variable models for this class of states because people wanted to understand them uh, since Werner. And typically in this industry, it was just uh, much easier to derive models for projective measurements. Okay, so you have a rich family of models for projective measurements. Uh, and uh, it just so happens that those, uh, okay, there is some not very complicated uh, fact that allows you to use projective simulability results in conjunction with some knowledge about local models for projective measurements to define new local models for POVMs. And it goes like this. You assume that for uh, for some parameter t, the, uh, a state is projective measurement local. And then what you can show is uh, when you act on the state with the polarizing channel that corresponds on, on one party, that corresponds with this depolarizing parameter, uh, you can get a model for a new state, which is just C times this original parameter T, uh, but this model will be for P of Vms. So for models for rho T, for projective measurements, I'm generating models for rho CT, when the C is, uh, in my case, just absolute constant. And now, uh, just applying this result about the polarizing noise, we are actually improving greatly over state of the art. Okay, so uh, we prove uh, that for all t, for all these, uh, in the case of Werner states, for all t's that are uh, okay smaller than the constant times roughly one, okay, you are. Uh, uh, you are uh, local, okay? But previously, uh, so you know, you, we know that we are local up to a constant, roughly, uh, for those random states. But previously, just people know that you are local up to one over d only, and that was a separate paper about this this case by Barrett from over twenty years ago. So improve uh, asymptotically by a constant factor, and people couldn't improve it for 20 years, so this result of ours improves it. We'll get more modest, say, uh, advantage, namely logarithmic, uh, for the case of overstate of the art uh, for uh, isotropic states. Now, uh, right, uh, I'm, I'm really out of time, so it's not so, uh, let me just, uh, I'm open to, to discuss uh, and to, to go really into deeps of, uh, of, of proofs, but let me just sketch how we how we prove it. So uh, we have a few steps of the reduction. So we start with a general measurement on d-dimensional space. Uh, mm, effects can have possibly high rank, uh, and we can have very large number of outcomes. And now, so first, first we prove this is a mathematical statement that, that, that you can always get the target measurement M as a coarse graining of some, for, uh, just classical coarse graining of some other measurement M tilde. And this measurement M tilde not only has rank one, but it has the property that all the weights, they are basically equal up to arbitrary small precision. So I'm just, uh, th th those weights are really the same. So this is the first step. And in the later steps, we are simulate, we are, we want to say something about M tilde. Now, uh, right. And now uh, simulation, uh, right. So basically in the second step, we use some results from our work from 2022 that gave away 
to simulate um, generalized measurements, uh, arbitrary via measurements that don't have too many outcomes. Okay, so maybe just to give you uh, where is it? Sorry, uh, da, 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 just to give you a picture. Okay, so in this work that was published last year, we basically had some scheme that. Uh, in which we partition set of outcomes of our measurements into these joint subsets. And we sort of focus on simulating uh, effects, uh, like statistics from those subsets via some auxiliary measurements. Okay. And we, we define those guys in the suitable way. Uh, we, yeah. So, uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, right. And, but in that work, we knew we observed numer let's say numerically and for some analytic cases that the protocol worked well in uh, in practice, but we couldn't prove that it works, uh, that it gives say that it works with high enough probability, whatever that means in this case. But uh, point is, uh, uh, thanks for insight of my co-author, Michal, uh, we are able to fix this and we use actually celebrated result uh, solution to the Cadison Singer conjecture by okay by I just want to quote those guys uh, right by Marcus Spielman Silvastrava they got Polia prize for it 10 years ago uh, and this is some deep result in functional analysis uh, that solved some problem that was open in, in uh, for 50 years, I believe, or so, uh, and just could reinterpret that result uh, to prove uh, that our scheme from previous paper worked with, uh, say, nice uh, with good success probability. Um, yeah, I uh, just thought there. And the last step, I know, um, maybe I, I missed like 10 minutes. Once more, the connection okay. is broken. So, I know that I can pretty well simulate my, uh, uh, my maybe now. Is it better, my unstable? Yes, 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 yes. Now I hear. Maybe I can. Uh, I can maybe. Okay, I can maybe hotspot for my mobile. I'm doing this for my <laughs> device anyway. So uh, the the last thing is that uh, we could reduce we could we know that we can simulate pretty well our measurements by by convex combinations of measurements that are kind of all almost like projected measurements because they have maybe non commuting effects like uh, L of them and L is like smaller than D over two they may be not commuting. So there might be some overlap. Not sure. Uh, there might be some overlap between them, and I have a complement to identity. Point is, such class of measurements we can still pretty well simulate by a convex combination of projective measurements, which uh, we named dimension deficient Neymark extension theorem. Okay, uh, which is some generalization. It's a some funny thing because you use you essentially do an eye mark, uh, but you uh, but for a part of the measure of your measurement which is non-trivial in a sense. So when you combine those things together, you get n some algebra, you get this this output, namely the simulation of arbitrary measurement in d-dimensional space uh, with depolarizing noise with constant visibility. Okay. Uh, and it has nice consequences, as I hope I conveyed. Uh, yeah, I'm just skipping through the proof, sketches of proofs. So conclusion, yeah, so so this is the main this is the main result. And there are some uh, applications so uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of the fact that for, uh, that we have this high uh, whiteness robustness. So there is a limit of usefulness of non-projective measurements for quantum state discrimination, for shadow quantum tomography. Uh, 
we improved greatly state of the art for local models for uh, important families of entangled quantum states. Uh, and the last part, I didn't have time to talk about it, but one can think that our results give you a way to compress uh, quantum circuits. So when you have a generalized measurement on n qubits, you can think of it as performing a, a projective measurement on two n qubits. Okay, so this is how Neymar construction would work for you. But still, our result tells you that you don't need to perform projective measurement on two n qubits, but instead you can do randomization of our measurements on n qubits. So you can have potentially a saving. But I should say our result is non-constructive and not algorithmic. Okay, because we use this beautiful functional analysis result, which does it's not constructive. We just uh, and it's actually an open problem. Uh, Ah, the tools. Okay, I wasn't talking about the tools. So uh, we use this technique that we developed across the years called simulation for selection. Uh, Michal uh, found a nice connection to Cadison Singer problem. Uh, and uh, we concluded the whole story with uh, dimension deficient Neymar theorem. Just the last slide, uh, open problems for the future. So uh, I would really like to push this uh, this idea to, to the algorithmic level. So uh, like really have like a compilation procedure that from a um, uh, prescription of a circuit on let's say two n qubits, you really spit out uh, of a measurement, really have a compilation procedure uh, that you can run on actual device. Uh, right, uh, that same concerns like POVM simulation and circuit compression. Uh, we would like to apply those ideas to port based reputation and simulation of sick POVMs. Uh, it's natural to attempt to, uh, to apply this to quantum instruments, namely, uh, uh like quantum measurements that care. What how uh, what, how ch state changes after you perform the measurement? Because what I was describing was just measurement statistics. I was ignoring the state after the like every single round of the measurement. Uh, would be great to have experimental implementation of uh, of those protocol of this of those protocols or some of their variants. However, I should say that even though uh, uh, providers of of quantum hardware they go in that direction. They currently don't have nice capability of fast changing of uh, of the setups. So it's uh, like, for example, for superconducting qubits, it's relatively easy to set up a circuit and repeat it many times. It's relatively expensive to tune it from shot to shot. So they are working on those ideas, but hardware doesn't support. Uh, and lastly, maybe, maybe there are some other applications of this kind of something there. Solution to cut some similar problem in quantum information. Uh, right. Uh, so uh, with, with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm open to questions and questions mm -hmm. yeah. from the audience here, maybe from Zoom. I have a comment. Okay. Uh, we have this uh, concerning the bell, the timing of the bell, uh, bell locality. Uh, there is Bernard family, which is the unitary invariant, is a drop it, which is orthogonal invariant. And I have a third family. Ortho uh, a symplectic unitary invariant. Yes, yes, yes. Which has uh, which actually has a uh, bounded argument. So might be that would be interesting. Uh, nobody looked at it at, at, at this family. So there are no bounds at all. Oh so whatever well, yeah, yeah, because it was hidden in, in, a, in another work which was uh, yeah, basically not the topic. So the idea is that perhaps uh, you could apply your your method and get some bounds or right. locality there, especially that you you can have a provably bounded time instead. Uh, interesting. So like no no uh, okay okay I uh, I'm not, okay but but in this work by Mafalda didn't they also consider because they sort of they put up it from they started from the model for the Werner state, they tweaked it a little bit. Okay, but it's interesting.
interesting comments yeah, like I would yeah. Look at. well First of all, I, I put in, in, in one of the works with Mafalda actually, that was, I don't remember if that was there, that was this uh, physical uh, structural approximation work. Okay. This family, it is hidden there as a sound example, but since mm -hmm. it did not concern the main topic of the work, it was basically right. uh, forgotten. Yes. But now that I see your nice uh, 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 presentation of table of the art and how you managed to push it, the idea is that might, might be interesting to look at that family as well because this is like the third missing family with the uh, with classical the group, uh, structure. Yeah, locally acting. Locally yeah. acting classical group structure apart from unitary and, and orthogonal. So yeah. just a couple of things. Can we ask you a question? Yes, please. Yes, can you hear me? Hello. 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 Yes, so my question is very simple concerning your one of your main results and this constant C, not speed of light, but mm -hmm. OO2. So the question is, how precise is this estimation or whether it can be saturated, this inequality? <laughs> That's a good question. So, you know, I mean, the paper is uh, not, not out yet, and I actually harass a bit uh, Michal to try to improve the constant. So I don't expect, I don't expect it to be uh to be very tight is just a result of you know uh, application let me just give you uh uh where is it uh sorry yeah you have this sort of chain of reductions uh the first step is not lossy i think you froze yes hello we cannot hear you anymore or 15 percent yeah, we are back, Carol. So, uh, right, right. So, so, so it's a result of combination of the. So, I, I think in general, it's, it's actually more closer to ten percent. Uh, that's my be, uh, belief. <laughs> yeah, but this is just a belief. Can you be close? You will find this constant number here. No, it's sort of concatenation of some results that are explicit. Mm -hmm. uh, so, mm, like we have just some procedures that we concatenate, and it's like multi, it's some algebra with rational function. Like with, it's not a, it's like Mickey Mouse algebra, really. Like just you combine things and you keep track of it. Maybe you have some optimization procedure on the way. We didn't try extremely hard at optimizing. But in the end, it's not exactly zero point zero two, right? Or, or Sorry. But in the end, it's not exactly zero point zero zero two. No, no, this is a bound. This is a bound. So, so this is like upper. Uh, this is upper bound. Uh, sorry, lower bound on the minimal uh, in the given dimension. Uh, in, uh, in all dimensions, it can be larger. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Uh, I have a question, if uh, you can hear me. Yes, yeah. hey, Oliver. Hey, uh, so you gave a few examples of um, problems where this result means you don't get um, an unbanded asymptotic improvement by using uh, POVMs instead of projected measurements. So are there any tasks where you do get, uh, or where you can still get an improvement by uh, using POVMs? Right, so one task, that we already identified uh, in a paper with Philip and Zbyszek uh, in 2018, I believe, is unambiguous state discrimination. So uh, for unambiguous state, disc uh, you know, maybe you're, this is the variant of state discrimination where you, where you are not allowed to make a false, like a, uh, a false positive answer, like to identify wrongly the state. You have to abstain from the answer. Uh, then uh, the advantage grows with D. Okay, but uh, this is like this is because of the stringent condition of uh, unambiguous state that you have in unambiguous state discrimination. Uh, perhaps in port based port based interpretation you can have it. Okay. Okay. Uh, as well, because uh, I mean, I would. It's technical. I'm happy to just because uh, there you actually need uh, the performance. You have like the ratio between that, like 
state discrimination tasks that are associated to the sport-based reputation need to be one. If it's not one, or asymptotically one, if it's not one, then you are losing, uh, let's say. So there you can maybe uh, think of having some and uh, some variants of metrology. Because, uh, uh, yeah, this I didn't talk that much, but if we allow one extra qubit, basically all tasks in metrology you can do pretty well. Uh, uh, you can do uh, pretty well with projective measurements that involve just a single qubit. And this is because uh, we use simulation with post selection, which is like this flag of the wrong answer that we discussed this morning. While uh, for uh, uh, when you don't have extra uh, qubits, we don't simulate with post selection. We simulate really noisy versions of of, of measurements. And I, I was discussing with Rafa, uh, Demkov, Dobzhansky, and uh, and it's not clear. And there might be an advantage there still uh, in terms of like number of like when number of parameters that you want to estimate this large. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for the seminar.